And of course, I thought of the hymn, and I kind of wanted to read over the, the words to it, because they're really good. It says, Once far from God and dead in sin, no light my heart could see. But in God's word the light I found, now Christ liveth in me. As rays of light from yonder sun, the flowers of earth set free, so life and light and love came forth from Christ living in me. As lives the flower within the seed, as in the cone the tree, so praise the God of truth and grace, his spirit dwelleth in me. And with longing all my heart is filled, that like him I may be, as on the wondrous thought I dwell, that Christ liveth in me. Now Christ, who is righteous, he lives in us. Now this world, he, they don't know Christ. Even some professing believers, they don't recognize that Christ is in them. But it is extremely important that we be able to identify that Christ is living in us. Because we are a temple for the Spirit of God. Amen. Not fitting in, conflict, dissatisfaction with being mediocre. All this happens because the Son of God is living in you. Now Jesus even made a point to tell us, they hate you because of me. They hated me first. Although you can't see it externally yet, those of Christ are different than the ungodly. You are no longer of this world. Now Christ, he doesn't just dwell in anyone, although some think differently. And I know this may trot on some feet, but people saying that you can come as you are and Christ will accept you, that you're once saved no matter what you do, you're always saved, or even pray this simple prayer and Christ will automatically come into your heart. These ideas... I see that they mock Christ because he who knew no sin didn't bear it so that you could keep living in it. And he refuses to dwell in a compromised person. He's not going to compromise himself to try and win your mere heart in an area that you let sin run freely. He expects complete change, a heart of flesh instead of a stony one, a total and complete cleansing. The king of kings will not reside in a heart coated with the filth that he gave his life to get rid of. Yeah. Now flesh is going to argue, I have my right. A person can only take so much for striving for perfection. A little bit is okay. I'm just weaning myself off. I'll quit eventually. I like the scripture's response. In 1 Corinthians 6 it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which ye have of God, are you not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are both God's. Amen. So we see that this kind of environment that Christ requires to dwell in. Now this isn't a pointless struggle. Christ lives in us so that we may, he may work in us and through us. A person who is sensitive and heeds the words of the Spirit, guiding God can and will do great things through. Crucifying the flesh, it doesn't feel good. But when you remember that Christ is in you, who is your hope, it gives you the strength to do it. This temple that we have, it is high maintenance. But if Christ be in you, he is the king. He is powerful. He will give you the power to keep your members under, under subjection. And this is a precious thought, a precious thing to have Christ dwelling in us. In a way, it's a privilege, it's a mercy, it's an encouragement to us. We want him to work in us, to have his will worked freely through us. So when you consider that and the blessing and the joy in this, it'll give you that drive to keep yourself pure and your heart loyal to Christ. Amen. So if you're tempted to look back at what you once were of yourself, remember in Romans 6 it says, What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, your fruit, you have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now the Spirit can leave you. If you mess around, Christ will leave you. And this is this is frightening thought because we are accepted by him who is in us so don't grieve the spirit live knowing that the prince of peace dwells in you and live for him christ is our hope and he is in us so i like in romans 8 it says this it gives us a picture of this hope that we have you are not in the flesh but in the spirit 
If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, yeah. he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies mm -hmm. by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Amen. I'm always blessed when I hear the saints speak about the Lord. You know, the, it's the faith that's in you that when you speak, and, and it's evident. It, it, it makes itself, it manifests itself. If you have faith, you can't hardly, hardly speak without it just getting out. <laughs> we heard that this morning in the Sunday school, didn't we? This, this class, this, it, it just got out. It just, we were edified. I want to introduce the greatness of this uh, truth with a little introduction, but it's not going to be mine. I, I, I thought probably best to use Paul's introduction to this, which is um, a few verses before the text. He introduces this very, very nicely here. In Colossians 1, starting at verse 12, he says, Giving thanks unto the Father. Uh, isn't that a good place to start? Well, what we're getting ready to talk about is so great, yeah. if you see it rightly, this will just be something you do. Amen. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. This is something God's done. Amen. And we're, boy, it's glorious in our eyes. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, if you just take a moment and just remember, just reflect for a second. Remember when you used to be dominated by sin? God delivered you from that. He delivered you from the power. You couldn't, you couldn't walk out on your own. There wasn't anything you could do except realize you were there. Now, he gave you that. He delivered you from the power of darkness, and he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Yeah. Even, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. This is what it took. Now, this is what it took. All this had to happen before our text. This, this couldn't happen any other way. You couldn't be dominated by sin and have Christ living in you. It just, this couldn't happen. Who is the, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created there in heaven, and there are on the earth, and visible and invisible, whether to be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, if he would do that with the natural creation, how much more is he doing this in the new creation? If he would be the one that God entrusted, to he, he entrusted him to do this work in the natural creation. We look around. Scientists are looking around. They can't fathom the depth of it. They look and look and look, and no matter how small they look, it's still wondrous and glorious and, and impossible for them to figure out. They look out there in the space, and it just goes on and on. It seems forever. But when you come into the new creation, things are even much more glorious than this. Much more glorious. You know, it's a blessing to see that God is on the initiative concerning the salvation of men. Amen. If God didn't want to save anyone, no one would be saved. We'd just die and go to hell. That's just the way it'd be. There wasn't anything. God didn't look at you and say, oh, they're so attractive. Let's come down there, son. Look at... No, no. This, this was God's eternal purpose before the world was ever made, before the first man was ever created. This was a, a purpose of God. God has a purpose. Now, isn't it good to know that you're serving a God that has a purpose? Now, you may not understand all of the purpose at this present time, but you just keep putting your hand to the plow. He opens up more of it and more of it. How does he get you to do the things that you do? How does God get you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present generation? He shows you a little bit of what he's doing. Just a little bit. What do you do? You'll lay down your life. 
That's how potent, that's how potent it is when God reveals some aspect of his nature to you. It's potent. And so you'll, you'll, volunteer. you'll volunteer. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs and some of them volunteered. Why? Because see, they saw something. They saw God for who he was to some degree. Now, no man besides the man Christ Jesus has ever seen God for who he is. I mean, we see a glimpse as it were. And even that is so potent. You'll lay down your life. You'll, you'll do it. Now, just consider just for a second. He, he's made us meet or capable. I like that. Or he's, he's the one that has qualified us for, the, for Christ to live in us. Christ, this was well said. Such long as he just doesn't live in everybody. See, there's some, there's, some, there's, there's got to be a qualification. God's the one that does it. He makes us meet. Amen. He's enabled us to be a partaker of the inheritance. Are you telling me we're going to be a, a, a fellow heirs with Christ? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. That's what it, we've been told that why we need to know it. You're not going to lay down your life if you think it's for nothing. No one's going to do that. Not even in the world. I, I wouldn't be building cabinets for the hospital if they didn't send me a check when I'm done. It wouldn't happen. I'll tell you right up front. It wouldn't happen. I'd move on to something else. It's just the way we're, we're made that way. We're looking for incentives in everything we do. Now God's held out the ultimate incentive. The ultimate. You can be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints and life. You, you can do it. I see, it wasn't by works of righteousness that you've done. We, we know this. And anybody who's serious will testify. This is not, no, it wasn't anything I did. But it was something Jesus did for us. He's the one that's translated. I don't even know how to speak that kind of language. <laughs> but Jesus does. Jesus knows God. He knows what God's looking for. He knows, he knows what the qualifications are. And he's translated us. Is It's in the process. It's, that's all good. But it's all in order that we would get down to verse 25, as it were. Whereof, Paul says, I am made a minister. I get this now. This, this is good stuff. Paul's going to show us a little bit of what, what he's understood about his ministry. Paul, see, Paul's... Paul's wise, and so Paul's going to divulge this. Well, we never know it. He's going to tell us this stuff. I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Paul was given some stuff for you. Now, you can say this to every generation, every generation down the line. People have been wondering, I wonder if it's relevant for this time. God gave something to Paul for you. And you're not going to get it from anybody else. You're going to have to submit to the teachings of Brother Paul. And if you do, see, you'll get it. You'll get, in other words, you'll get the encouragement. You'll get the understanding because Paul was faithful. All right, so he's given it to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from the ages, from generations, but now. Praise God, we have it now. It's manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is, if this doesn't occur, then no one's going to be saved. If Christ doesn't get on the inside, nothing good's ever going to come out on the outside. It's not going to happen. But, and if... Christ is working on the inside. It won't be long. It'll start manifesting itself. See, he, he, Jesus isn't working any different in you than he worked when he was here in his own flesh. He's the same person. He hadn't changed. So see, uh, people say, well, I just can't stop. No, you're going to have to get Christ in you now. How are you going to get that done? So tell somebody, give, give, I'll give you something to do. Go home and get Christ in you. Well, see, what? How? How would you get that done? God gave this apostle Paul to understand a secret that had been hid before the world was made. There was a secret. See, you look back at, at, at uh, the prophets. 
there was something said about this, but how? How was God going to do this work? How was God? He said, Mary says, I'll give them a new heart. I'll write my law on their heart. How was God going to get this work done? Is it going to be through more laws or maybe a different system? Or maybe Paul's telling you, he, 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 he was given to understand the secret. We can understand it too. Amen. When it comes to making life changes differences in the saints, actually it's who you preach, not what you preach. I mean, I, I, I know we, there are some things we need to preach, but see, they're all in the context of who. It's who. Amen. To be sure, if you preach Christ and Him crucified, you will say the right thing. But see, I know, I know some people that are saying things, and technically they may even be slanted towards the right, but they're saying them for all the wrong reasons. And see, it's not having a good effect on people. It's leading them to think more of them than, than the one who ought to be exalted? Who who ought to be exalted? Christ. That's right. So he's um he, he's the one that should shine in in you know this I was thinking of this exhortation for myself. In, in my preaching this year, I want Christ. I want Christ to come to the surface. We're not here today to focus on who we are. We already know who we are, and without Christ, this is not worthy of something to talk about. Well. Christ in you. This is the larger and more expansive part of, of the, you know, it does say Christ in you. But see, Christ is the, the, Christ is the important one in that equation. We, if Christ is in me, then I become a lot bigger than, than I'm before. Today I want to consider this truth about Christ being in you. And how that, that see, that itself will will tend to give you more of an understanding or more of a hope of that day when you're going to be glorified together with him it, why why are people hoping because i i fear it's because christ isn't in them if christ is in you it, you're gonna have some hope christ works there are some who insist and i know that some of you have even had contact with some of these individuals that they believe and they teach that you only have as much of God in you as you have of the scripture in you. So they'll read this text, Christ in you, and they'll say, as we get this, as we imbibe this book in us, and we start to understand it, that's as much of God as we have. But see, there's an element of truth to that. And so see, what? Well, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to disprove that the word of God isn't living and active and able to make you wise unto salvation. That's not it. Is, it. is this what he's talking about? Is Christ in you mean that we need to get more of scripture in us? Jesus told the devil once, remember he says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, at the same time that Jesus told them that, they had what we would call the Old Covenant Scriptures. They would have Moses and the prophets, remember? In fact, that was a quote from Deuteronomy, from Moses and the prophets. So if it was just, was Jesus, did, it, would you just get, if we get more of the word into the Pharisees, then they wouldn't crucify Christ. Is that, it, would that even work? See, that's not what he's talking about here. When he's talking about Christ living in you, something new is happening. That's why he said this was a secret. They knew the scriptures, but they didn't know this secret, did they? Paul revealed, I mean, God revealed it to Paul. Now Paul's telling us every word of God is valid and it is profitable. We, we know that. We have that by revelation. Every word of God's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Why? So that we can be perfect. See, well, we could grow up in the Christ. But is that what he's talking about here? We just need to get more of the Bible in us. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So see, it's not, we're, not, we're not faulting people for saying we need more of the scriptures, but is this what he's saying here is my point. Is he saying we need to get more of the raw word in us, or do we need to have the word living in us? Because even though the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
you're never going to understand the implications of that unless Christ is living in you. See, God's, God's going to do the work from the inside out. And, and we're told, we know, we talked about during the class today, that it's, it's the operation of God. It's when God puts you into Christ that now, now we can get some work done. And now, from God's standpoint, now, okay, now we have old things are passed away. He's dead. This person now is dead to sin and alive to God. Now the scripture take on a whole new meaning, don't they? Now all of a sudden you start seeing things in there you never saw before. Why? Because now you're alive to God. Now you have of his spirit. Now, probably just jumped ahead, but that was worth it. Now with the mind of God, see, remember it talks about us having the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. It means we can think like Christ. In other words, when, when we handle scripture and you compare one scripture to another scripture, you handle it rightly. You can, you can make these kind of judgments, and we're going to have to make a lot of these kind of judgments if we're going to make it successfully from here to there. We're going to have to make comparisons, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. We're going to have to be able to do this Otherwise, Satan, see, he, he can trick us. He can trick you into thinking what you're doing. Is, this, is, this is from God. We'll just, well, if, you got, if you're walking in the Spirit, you'll be able to properly navigate these avenues of thinking. If we can, if we can think right, then I'm talking about thinking with Christ, within the Spirit, then we'll, we'll do right. We'll, we'll do it. I mean, these same scriptures were known, talking about the scriptures that Jesus was quoting to, to Satan there. They were known by the Pharisees, and they killed Christ. They killed him. And they knew the scriptures. Why couldn't they see it? Well, they didn't have, they didn't have Christ living in. Christ wasn't formed in any of them. See, Christ had to die. Sin had to be removed. And that's really what Paul's given thanks for in the beginning. Uh, uh, verses of chapter 1 there, he's given thanks that Christ has come and he's taken away sin and he's made it. Uh, now it's possible for God to work in men. I know some people say well, if you, they can't have the Holy Spirit really, really live in you. It's just a metaphor. You can't really have the Holy Spirit living in you because if you did, you'd blow up. Well, that's just foolishness. God is a spirit and he's given us us, those who believe, of his Holy Spirit to where we could know the things. But Jesus said, I'll send the comfort so you, so you can know. You'll be able to understand me now. Well, I want to understand him. Amen. I don't want to go around my whole life here scratching my head wondering what did he mean by that? Because isn't that before the apostles got the Spirit, isn't that what they did? They wanted to do it. They had a good desire. They wanted to know what Jesus was talking. They stayed with him for three years. They didn't go off someplace. They wanted to know. But see, it wasn't possible yet. Sin had to be put away. Christ had to, had to die, and he did. And so Paul's giving thanks to God. Look at, look, at, look at what's come from this death of Christ. A whole new race of men. And they, they can know God, and God can live in them. Remember, he said, man, my father will come. We'll make our abode in you. Now, when Jesus and God are at home, at home in you, I'm talking about a, a, this was a, a good thing. This is, you receive this with gladness. And you can make some progress in the kingdom of God. It, it, I think it was the experts in the law that crucified Christ. They knew the text, but they didn't know the one who wrote the text. They didn't know. They didn't understand. He, Jesus said if they did, they wouldn't crucify me. If they would have just understood what they were doing, that's why he could say. But see, this is why. What a great provision. He said, this is, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But see, that time's passed. That time's passed now. Nobody, let nobody say, I, I just, it was an error. No, no, Christ has died, yea, rather risen from the dead, and the Holy Spirit now can live inside of you and bring you up to where you can, you can know and understand and navigate into these things, and you can actually glorify God 
because you can understand what he means. In light of that, he says, um, what is? He said, he said this, this, Paul, see, to those people who say that you, you can't really have the Holy Spirit living, you, the only thing you're going to have of God is his word in you. To those people, I would say, Paul is saying here that this, what he's talking about, whatever he's talking about is a fulfillment of scripture. He's not saying you need to have more scripture in you. He's saying what I'm going to tell you today is a fulfillment of what the scripture prophesied. That's different. That's different than that. Paul's telling us that what God has sent him to declare is, is the fulfillment of, 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 of a time when Christ, God, would live in the people. He, he would give you a new heart. Do you have a new heart? Well, you got it from Christ. You got it when God, through the operation of God, God gave you a new heart. In other words, in other words, you want to do what's right. You really do have a desire. You're, you're new. All things are made new, not just a refurbishing of the old. His atoning death is relevant because it is the only blood that can save people. Well, now, the effect of this, you know that's effective because you've been given a new heart. You're new. How would God do it? Ezekiel said, in Ezekiel 37, 26, and 27, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. Now, what's he talking about in the middle of Jerusalem and then yet all liver? He's talking about in you, Christ, in you, the hope of glory. But how are you going to figure it out from that text? How are you going to look at that and say, God's going to live inside of us? They knew what they were. In the midst of them, he says, my tabernacle also shall be with them. I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. How's God going to be able to get this done? Paul's telling us it's Christ in you. That's how he's going to get it done. How is he going to ensure that you're actually going to, going to make it from here all the way to there? God sent his spirit into your heart crying, Abba, Father, you got the Holy Spirit on your side now, yeah. making requests for you. Well, I just love the thought. I remember who said it, but when the Holy Spirit moves in, he takes inventory. I love that. I need, I need the Holy Spirit inside of me, identifying things that are wrong and then making a request to God, say, he needs help here, Father. I need that. I know we all do. Know you not? It's just already been quoted this morning. Don't you know that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now, if that was the only scripture we had, it'd be enough. Yeah. It, it, just to refudiate any foolishness that the Holy Spirit can't live in you. It says right here that he does dwell in me. Yeah. Those that believe. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now, see, that's powerful stuff. That's potent stuff. So, I don't want to say, I don't want to offend anybody. Offend people. Some people need to be offended. Offend them. Well, I wouldn't want to go out of my way to offend them with my words, but God's words, that's a different kind of offense. Yeah. See, when, when, when God offends someone, he doesn't hurt people just to hurt them. He hurts them to help them. Yeah. Those who make an attempt to justify any doctrine that's in contradiction with something an apostle said, well, they just revealed they're not wise. It's not wise to go against an apostle. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Well, see, do you, if you're in Christ and you're walking with the Holy Spirit, you, you instantly know the answer to that, right? <laughs> there is no, we don't have any agreement with, with idols. It's anything that would exalt itself higher than Christ. Anything. No, see, why are, why are we concerned about this? Because, see, now you're the temple of God. God's living in you. Amen. All right, so... He's saying, this is, you got to take care now. You got to, got to be aware that God's in you. So now you're going to go someplace and where God's going to be offended. You're going to do something where God's going to be offended. You, you see how this is, it's taking on new light now. 
And then, then we read elsewhere, some of us already mentioned that today. You can grieve the Holy Spirit of promise. You can grieve that spirit that's in you out because he's holy. Well, isn't it good to know that God's in you? He's in you. It means he can lead you into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He can do that. Now, before it was like, a, you know, when David looked, he looked forward. Oh, with great anticipation, by the way. Look forward to the time when he was leading beside still waters. Now God's in you. He can lead you into the paths of righteousness. He's doing it. He's doing the work. Actually, the most substantial work, part of the work is done by him. But see, we're following him, right? We're following the lamb, whithersoever he goes. How is it that God and Christ come to make their abode in us? We've already been mentioned. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death in order that we might live, right? Therefore, we're buried with him into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life, in a different kind of life. We explored that in the, in the, in the class this morning, too. This is a, this is a wonderful introduction i sat there through the class thinking this is god's them doing some work here christ in you so now you can say and you can know what you're saying greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world uh in the old time like i said the prophets they, they look forward to this we have this reality christ in you well now if that doesn't provoke you and there's nothing else will. This, this, God doesn't have any greater thing to offer people than, than God being in you, leading you, protecting you. He says, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, it's also been mentioned today that this is not a one-time thing. It's like, well, I, I remember I was baptized back in 1928. I, have you ever heard that before? Somebody placing the emphasis of their trust on something they did 50 years ago. Now, see, this is not wise. This is not wise. This, this right here, you, 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 Paul said, I protest. I die daily. Every single day when I get up, I'm going to, I know, I enter the day, face forward. I'm going to have to die to what I want, and I'm going to have to live to what he wants. I'm going to have to put my foot forward thinking this. See, on purpose. Now, if you do that, God will honor that. He'll honor that. And you'll have grace. You'll have grace to overcome. See, I don't know. The, I, don't, I don't read anywhere. And I, in my own experience, I can't testify that I have any kind of power to eject the old man out of my body. It is, I am going to have to learn to live with this situation. But by God's grace, you, the new man, is greater than the old man. God being in you, Christ in you, is more powerful than Adam in you. We put on Christ, right? We put him on. See, it's not, it's not my new man, it's the new man. I'm part of an aggregate. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, I tell you, this is much more powerful than an than individual little Christ running around. See, see, we're part of him. He's in us. So he can guide you into the ways of peace. Put off the old man with his old deeds. Now, that's got to happen. We, we all know that. We all know that there's, there's deeds, there's things that, that he, all of us, their old man tries to lead us into. He, he tries, in other words, he tries to get you to do something that he wants to do. Say, wait a minute, I thought he was dead. Well, he is dead. You don't give him expression. But as long as you got this old body, you're going to have this old nature, and it's yeah. going to try to find a, a way to express itself. So how, to, how do you fight with that? Put on Christ. Another way of saying it is put on the whole armor of God. See, walk in the Spirit, yeah. and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You'll be able to comprehend to say no to unrighteousness and yes to godliness. Yeah. Amen. It isn't like magic. 
It's not like, well, I, I put on, 20 years ago, I put on Christ. I was baptized. And now I'm just living a sanctified life, and everything's wonderful, and I'm just smiling all the way to heaven. Well, you, that isn't the way re reality is. Reality is, is it's a war. It's a fight the whole way there. But how do you win this fight? You put on Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor in circumcision, but a new creature. You think different. You, why do you think different? Because you are different. It's a new man. And this man is focused more on the things that are in heaven and less on the things of the world. Now there are some things we got to get done down here, but you do them in light of the new things. Amen. See, one man said, well, you do them like a man that was working out in the rain. You just get them done as quick as you can and get back in. I, I don't hang out in the rain too much myself. But, you know, if you got to do something, you got to do it. And God's put us here. We have to be faithful. We don't want to be foolish here and just write off what we got to do. But, see, you can do all things heartily as unto the Lord and not as unto men. Now, that's a grace. That's grace for you. He makes life doable. Once it's seen, you can find continual references. Once you see that what he's talking, what Paul's talking about, one, one, all of a sudden you look back in the old covenant, it's filled with expressions like this. We don't have time to go into all of them, but there, I'm going to give them a new heart, yeah. a new heart, a new spirit. Be there with them. Put you on. Lord Jesus Christ, and make, make not provision for the flesh. So well, what's he talking about? Does that mean you just couldn't go to work? No, that's what he's, he's talking about. We talked about it this morning. There's, some, there's, there's, there's a, a nature to flesh. Don't make a provision. Don't give him a, a way to express himself. Don't allow that to happen. Well, see, that's a big responsibility, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say that's, he says to you, don't, don't you make an, a, a, a way for your flesh to express itself. So how are you going to get that done? Put on Christ. That's what he said. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way, another way of saying it is this mind. Think like Christ thinks. How does Christ think about this? Of course, now, that means you're going to have to not be impetuous and just do something without thinking about it. You have to look at the situation and say, well, what, is, what would Christ do? See, but if Christ is living in you, isn't that like an impulse? Isn't it like something like, I don't like cottage cheese. I'm sorry, I don't like it. I'm never, ever, ever going to be up at 3 o'clock in the morning raiding the refrigerator and eating all your cottage cheese because I hate it. Now, when I hate sin to that degree, I won't do it. But see, not every area is the same. There are some areas that, quite frankly, my flesh, it just doesn't want to give up. It says, no. Well, put on the Lord. Jesus Christ, and you'll be able to conquer those areas. Paul's taking, taking the people back to the start. Back to the, see, this has been God's purpose the whole time. How is God gonna, gonna, gonna redeem a man that was lost in sin? How is he gonna do this? Well, there, this was a, this was the same plan, the same purpose from the very beginning. Amen. Paul's identified this. He's been given to see the secret. Amen. This is how God's going to get his work done. This is how God's going to bring many sons of glory. He's going to put Christ in them. And that's going to provoke this longing for heaven. And that longing is going to be so dominant in them that they'll deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And what's that going to do? That's going to glorify God because he did the work. He's the one that put Christ in you. He's the one that took away sin and, and put Christ in you. So when you end up there, what is the first thing you'll do? You'll throw your crown at his feet. Say, you brought us here, Lord. You are the one that worked in us, both the will and the do of your own good pleasure. Now, he'll say, and you're the one that did it. So you're the one that crucified the flesh. Now, I know I gave you the power, but son, you did it. See, good and faithful servant. See, that's what he's going to say back to us. Good and faithful servant. You, you followed. I led you. I led you the whole way, but, but you followed me. Amen. You crucified that flesh, and the sun will stay, and it was hard. I know. 
See, he's been here. He knows what it's like to be here. So now he knows how to lead us to glory. Amen. Remember one time the Galatians, they had moved away from the hope that was in the gospel. They had traded for something lower. See, it's maybe it even seemed like it made sense at the time. Maybe it's, it seemed like, well, it's, it wouldn't hurt us to, to do a little bit of good work too, right? I mean, you know, we, it wouldn't be hurt for us to be circumcised. Come on now. Not a bad thing. Well, it is when you're doing it for salvation. That's a bad thing. He tells them here in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth the Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons. And because you're sons, not because of what you did, because you're sons, God has sent forth the Spirit, the Spirit of a son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, where art thou, where art thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, you're, you haven't found this status because of something you did. It's something that he did. He, he you, were, you were his son, so he gave you his spirit. Oh, I tell you, this is, this is, this is the, the gospel. He, it's a God. God's doing the work. But you're involved in it. <laughs> See, well, for the time, they should, have been, they should have been doing a lot better than they were doing. And so he had to address this word to them. 419, it says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again, again, until Christ be formed in you. See, they had traded down, as it were, and they had been led astray. Paul knew this was going on. Why is he writing this letter to the Colossians? Because Paul knows, unless a person is rooted in, 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 in the faith, and they, they know what's going on, that they know the eternal purpose of God, that they know that God's working in them, both to will and to do, and it's not by works of righteousness that they've done, they'll easily be led off this path into legalism. They'll just start thinking, it'll just be a little thing. I just do this little thing over there, and I feel good about it. I feel good. See, now God must love me more because I did this. Is that, is that right? Can God love you more because of something you did? Well, then Christ died in vain then. No, see, God's going to love you more because of what Christ did, and your reception of that, that your reception of what he did and the removal of your sin is what makes you what makes God, God's going to say, well done. Amen. Not some other thing that you do. No, it's not going to work that way. So what does he say to him? I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. I, I'm not even sure if this is going to be resolved. Can a person trade? See, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute, this says that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Yeah, well, you can grieve the Holy Spirit of promise too. So see, see well, should we walk around always in doubt? No, we should be sober. Sober-minded. We're living in a world Satan knows. He knows the tactics. He knows to what to try to offer you, to try to get you to, to trade down to something, something lesser. I just say don't do it. Some of the Corinthians thought they could challenge the Apostle Paul. Remember, he, they, they, thought, they thought they had false teachers come in and they started bad-mouthing Paul. What, what happened? They, they left a lot more than Paul. They were leaving Christ. False teachers got them to leave Christ. What it, Paul told them, he, Paul knows that there's a certain power. When, when you walk in Christ, when Christ is in you, you have a certain power over sin. But if you don't, you don't have any power. You'll do things you, ne you never imagined you would do these things. We had people that came to this assembly that went off and did things they couldn't have imagined they would do those things. I just heard a sermon last night from Floyd Coffin who went off and did unimaginable. Why? Because he let this slip. That's why. Uh -huh. Oh, I tell you, I was encouraged. You don't want to let these things slip. Amen. See, you walk in the Spirit. Walk. Why does he, he we say it? 
because there is no other way. There is no other way to crucify the flesh. You gotta have Christ in you if you're gonna have the hope of glory. Paul knew if he could just, as it were, get back to Corinth. So he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter and they received it. What happened? They changed him. See, they got him back on course. But Paul saw this coming into the early churches. It was false prophets coming in. And they were just changing it a little bit. Getting, them, getting the people to think more of them and less of Christ. No, if Satan can get your mind off of the glory that's going to be revealed in us, oh, he's got you. He's got you. If you can just get your mind thinking, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it really is all about me. No, it's not all about you. It's all about him. It's all about Christ and what he can do in you. What is the riches of the glory of this mystery? It, what is the end game, as it were, for God? When all the children are home. And all, all, he's, when he looks at Christ and he says, well done, son. Look, you brought the children home. You want to be part of that. See, I know you want to be part of that because you're here. <laughs> I know you want to be part of that because you're fighting a great fight of affliction right now. You're putting up with something that you couldn't have never put up with if you weren't in Christ. But see, you are, and you want, you want that. And I, and I know you want that. I want that too. You want to find out what is the riches of the glory. Yeah. See, we, we, we just know it in part now. We just, we're just tasting of, the, tasting of the powers of the world. We don't have them yet. We're tasting of them, though, and I have to confess they're good. They're able to make you... Deny ungodliness and worldly lust, right? You, this, this hope of glory. In other words, this hope of being known as one of his. On that day, when Christ accepts you, says to the Father, he's, he's with me. Oh, that'll be worth it all. Whatever it is, whatever you had to do, whatever you had to deny, whatever you had to give up, it all fails to compare with this glory that's going to be revealed in you. Paul wanted to be able to present people, the brethren, perfect in Christ, right? He, that, that's what, what he, he, he wanted to be. But he also knew that Satan and men could spoil them. That's what he says to Colossians, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. See, we, it's true. We have Christ in us. And as long as we're walking in the Spirit, it, it, it doesn't make any difference what you have to go through. You'll do it for Christ. But if that diminishes, if your eye gets off of that and you start looking at other things, well, you can be spoiled. We don't want to be spoiled. Paul knew that unless these brethren had a working understanding of where they've been seated in heaven. See, you've been seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. Right now, we're seated with him in heavenly places. But see, that's a dominion that has to be maintained. It's by faith now. But see, Paul knows that eventually, if you just keep your hand pressing on that plow, eventually it won't just be by faith, it'll be a reality. You'll be with Christ, and there'll be no more going out. Yeah, It'll be worth it all. If you then be risen with Christ, if you're one of these that Christ is right now actively working in, then this is my exhortation for you. If you then be risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God, and set your affection. Now, why does it have, why is it that every day we have to set our affection on things above? Because every day, every day you wake up, you got this old man with you. And believe me, he's just as wicked as he ever was. If he had his way about it, he would turn your mind off of the things to come. He would do it. I don't trust my old man anymore. There's only one thing I read in the scripture that, that we're supposed to do with him. Crucify him. Amen. Kill him. Amen. Don't allow him. To have any kind of work in you. Are you risen with Christ? Are you seeking those things which are above? Are you seated with Christ in heavenly places now? Are you dead and is your life hid with Christ in God? Then see, you're already tasting of what the hope of glory is. You already taste, you got a taste of it. 
Well, let that taste dominate your mind and your thinking and give the rest of your life for Christ. Thank you, brother. Amen.